Well, hello there and welcome to the second series of Small Screen Science, the podcast where we explore the science behind our favourite TV shows. I'm Karen. I'm Emma and this week we're calling the episode Blue Chip Science because we're back with a bang and we're very excited to be talking about some of the most popular shows on TV, big glossy nature documentaries and in particular the superb Blue Planet 2. Yeah, it's absolutely totally great to be back. Oh, it is. What are we talking about today? <laughs> well, we've got some brilliant guests lined up, including the amazing biologist and comedian Simon Watt and the BAFTA and Emmy Award winning natural history sound mixer Martin Harries. Yeah, and uh, obviously you'd have heard already three of our ocean puns that we're running through <laughs> the episode. So do listen out for those. They should be totally great. Oh, dear. <laughs> Now, okay, on to the show. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Blue Planet 2, because we could have picked any nature landmark series, really, yeah, couldn't this we? Yeah, true, we, yeah. We chose Blue Planet 2 in particular because it, when it came out, it was really celebrated for like raising awareness of plastic pollution in marine ecosystems mm -hmm. and really bringing messages of conservation to primetime audiences instead of just, wow, isn't this creature or landscape amazing? It really yeah. dived into our relationship with nature. Yeah, and I think I think what's really poignant about it is that um, experts think that by 2050 that the amount of plastic in the ocean is actually going to weigh more than the amount of fish in the ocean if we don't do something about it and do it, do oh, it soon. I just can't wrap my head I can't wrap my head no. around those stats. It's 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 crazy. Yeah. And um if if you watch the show um and I think almost every single person on the planet did watch the show I think um, so. <laughs> you'll more than likely remember there was this one scene where a mother pilot whale was carrying her dead calf around uh, and it you know it had died experts think because of well because of human activities. Mm. So part of the problem there was was plastics yeah. and there's a chain of events known as bioaccumulation. So if there's mm. a toxin in the environment that the small uh, little critters at the bottom of the uh, food chain can interact with. They can take it up, they can eat this toxin. Uh, so in this instance, it was thought that it was industrial chemicals had gotten into the water. Yeah. So all the krill and the small um, little bits and bobs that are floating around in the ocean, um, were each of them taking on a tiny bit of this toxin. But then the mother whale is obviously eating fish, which have eaten quite a lot of these little bits of krill. Mm. And then more had built up in the fish. And then the mother whale was eating bigger fish and bigger amounts of this toxin. Yeah. To the point where her own milk that she was producing was toxic to the calf. So the calf died, which, which is, is was just heartbreaking. It's gutting, isn't it? And, and to think that we're responsible as a species for that is just quite scary. I know. Yeah. And the problem, interestingly, the, so the problem isn't just that these toxins are getting into the environment. Plastics are actually making it worse. So we know about macroplastics, big, big plastics that you can see, mm. but microplastics are these small under five millimeter pieces of plastic. And actually toxins and chemicals will adhere to the surface of these plastic, especially in an ocean environment. Mm. So if these plastics are being consumed, the toxins are also being consumed. And the more microplastics there are, the more of these tiny little bits, the larger the surface area of available plastic in the ocean to take on these chemicals is. So the more the problem is. Yeah. It's quite scary. It really is. God, we really started with the downer, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the series. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the other problems is, is that um, quite often um, these programs will use large kind of charismatic creatures, won't they, in the, you know, in the programming? Yeah, they'll know. They know what's visually appealing. They know mm. that to get us on board, you, you've got to get the whales in. You've got to get the orangutans. You've got to get something cute. You've got to get something big that we can really connect to. But these problems that are being described are not just happening to these big charismatic megafauna. They're also a problem for everything at the bottom of the food chain, you know, small, unsexy invertebrates like shellfish and worms and things. Yeah. And, and you know, framing the issue um, on these charismatic wildlife means that um, it suggests that the problem lies with, with the uh, macroplastics because quite often you'll see images of a turtle or a seal wrapped up in some kind of piece of plastic that they picked mm. up in the ocean, don't you? Um, and, and you don't necessarily hear about these other organisms that might be being affected by the microplastics. And that's what was really good about Blue Planet 2 is that it did talk about the microplastics uh, in that way, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, and it also actually shifted the focus from being this is the, you know this is the issue this is what it's causing these animals are dying mm. it actually flipped it around held a mirror up to society and was like look this problem is occurring 
and it is humans' fault. We need to address how we're using plastics in our personal lives and as society. Um, so I think that's why it became such a really impactful um, piece of TV because viewers, you know, were expecting to watch this beautiful documentary, which of course they did, but they weren't mm. expecting to feel what is now known as the Blue Planet 2 effect. Yes. And and there haven't been any research papers that have looked into this yet that have been peer reviewed. But there has been a, a poll that was carried out to ask people in 2019 about, you know, um, the impact of the Blue Planet 2 effect mm. and, and to find out about, you know, whether they were going to do more litter picking or maybe use less, you know, single use plastics. And it, and it appears to have had a positive effect. And, you know, according mm. to this self-reporting survey, which is really, really positive. Yeah. And I mean, even anecdotally, you can mm. you can't deny that suddenly the world took a bit more interest in marine issues and plastic pollution immediately following the airing of Blue Planet 2. Yeah. So Which... anyway, let's take it back to mm -hmm. some science before yep. we start lecturing everybody on <laughs> how we should be um, interacting with our planet. Um, we've said that often the biggest characters in nature documentaries are things that we find cute. So mm. why is it, Karen, that we actually find animals cute? Well, I think we have the big question we need to start with first of all, and this is an extremely important question. Oh, you've you got your serious journalist <laughs> face on. Are you ready? Uh, which animal is the cutest? Oh, you could start a war over that. <laughs> you? Um, I am going to have to go with baby pandas, I think. Yeah. Because yeah. they're so fluffy and they're just really cute and just seem so, yeah, I'd love to hang out with some baby pandas for a day. Yeah, I mean, have you seen the um, the clip on YouTube where there's the lady cleaning out the panda pen with all the with all the baby <gasps> pandas? <laughs> yes, yeah, and they're like knocking over the bin that she's like been trying to fill <laughs> up to yeah. clean and they're trying to climb up her legs. Yeah, yeah. no, that would yeah, be great. Um, so we've identified that. So when you're watching um, your clip of, of your cute baby pandas, mm. there's an emotional response going through your body at that time because you're producing hormones and, you know, particular areas of your brain are responding to you watching that video. So yeah. what's that emotion called? It's just cute, isn't it? <laughs> Cuteness. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because in English, there isn't a word for that emotion. Oh, it's a trick question. Yeah, which is really strange because you you know in some languages there is there is, but in a lot of languages there isn't a word for that emotion. And so, in literature, it's often called cute emotion, which is not ah. really a proper word for it at all. And so much so that in 2016 there was uh, someone called Ralph Buckley, and he wrote a paper suggesting that the word that we should use to describe this emotion is, oh, definitely. Everybody <laughs> would know exactly what you meant. Yes. Yeah. So let's make so, that happen. <laughs> so officially, we've made that officially the word. So, yeah. Oh. Um, so in Japan, you know, cuteness is actually quite big culturally, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. They actually have a word for it, unlike mm. us. Kawaii. And it, it relates, um, this culture of cuteness doesn't just relate to baby things, but also for like non-infantile objects. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, an object can be cute or kawaii, which is really interesting. So um, babies naturally are, are designed to grab our attention, aren't they? Yeah, so not only do they look cute, you know, with their little button nose, their big eyes, big big head, big forehead. Mm. Their laugh is something that we find quite cute. Yeah. And e they're even supposed to smell cute, but of course that is dependent on how recently they've gone to the bathroom and yes. whether they need a nappy change. <laughs> yeah, not so cute then. Not so no. cute then. But actually, it's not just human babies that have these same kind of infantile features that determine mm. cuteness. Um, so this baby schema, this kind of facial proportions can also be seen in, in other animals. Yeah, which is why we find things like puppies and kittens cute, isn't it? Mm. Um, and what we do is actually um, consciously or maybe unconsciously when we carry out um, you know, selective breeding programs, as we have over time, we mm. might actually choose for these organisms to keep these juvenile or you know, baby schema features into adulthood, which is called neoteny. Now, one species that a lot of people would argue is not cute mm. is the spider. Yes. I mean, a lot of people actually, there's actually have spider phobia, don't they? The arachnophobia issue. Yeah. How are you with spiders? You all right with spiders? I'm okay, actually. Yeah. No, I don't mind. I don't mind spiders, except when they've got really, really disproportionately long legs. 
quite very yeah. thin legs. Yeah, I don't like a hairy. <laughs> I don't like a hairy leg. Um, <laughs> I, I watched um, David Attenborough actually um, spoke about spiders and maybe why people are scared of spiders, and it's because they've got eight legs. They're actually able to travel in any direction. Um, whereas, oh. like you know, if you were looking at a lion. Mm. you can tell what direction it's going to move in based on how its legs work and what direction it's it's facing but with a spider you have no idea which way it's going no i guess because you've got like a circle of legs basically haven't you You do yeah, yeah an entire circle a petticoat of legs <laughs> petticoat of legs i like it that's a t-shirt design Quite the image. <laughs> <laughs> and the, but not all spiders are the same so um Yesterday, I made you Google uh, jumping spiders, didn't I? You did. You did. So I just had thoughts? my dinner and I thought, I don't really want <laughs> to do this. But actually, I take it all back, my preconceived notions, there are such thing as quite cute spiders. It turns out these mm. jumping spiders fit the bill because they've got really big eyes. Yeah. And, and there's a whole different array of different ones, you know, really colourful and, and just... They've got this neoteny down pat, basically, haven't they? Mm, they just, yeah. you know, keep those cute baby looking features, even though you're a spider. Yeah, right the mm. way in through to spider adulthood. Yeah. And the thing is, is if you were making a natural history program to do with spiders, mm. the suggestion is, and the research suggests that you should start with the jumping spiders because they've got this cute look to them. And that oh, would be you a lure the audiences in. Exactly, your gateway spider into your program, <laughs> gateway and, then, spider. and then you could then you could get onto the more complicated species that maybe aren't quite so cute and a little bit more ugly or scary. Mm, okay, people, yeah, that's people why they don't like start natural history with proboscis monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the topic of cute animals and mm. indeed ugly animals, I think yep. we should introduce our first guest because we've got two excellent, excellent guests. This yeah, week. we've been so lucky and we thank them both for being so amazing. Um, so the first one is a biologist and comedian, Simon Watt, who is founder of the Ugly Animal Preservation Society, which a lot of what you a job title. have heard of. That's brilliant, isn't it? Um, and his, his idea is to bring ugly animals to the masses. So he champions hideous, ugly animals that other people might not you know, might not want to look at or think about, um, but particularly ones that need preserving. So ones that are on the endangered list, for example. Um, and I think this is really important. Simon, why don't you talk to us about the Ugly Animal Preservation Society? Well, the Ugly Animal Preservation Society is kind of two things simultaneously. First of all, it is a, a very serious campaign trying to address the balance of the fact that the ugly animals have been neglected for too long. Everybody knows the polar bear. Everybody knows the uh, panda. Not everybody knows the hagfish, the blobfish, the uh, roky snake, island snake necked turtle. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a real thing for a start. Uh, and then also it's just a joke that got out of hand. <laughs> it, it was literally, it started when I was saying to some friends that no one's ever had a campaign slogan saying, save the slug. And we needed to really rectify that. <laughs> um, and the other side of it was actually just because I, I was, um, one of my jobs is a science natural history presenter and... We were touring a book at a time, and at the end of all my talks, people were saying, Simon, what is your favourite animal? And then I watched their eyes glaze over as I'd start telling them about some really incredible ants. And, uh, <laughs> and then I'd be just a, I would be my own, you know, I'd have to spend the next 20 minutes ranting at them about how wrong and shallow and boring they are, and they should love all these other animals too. So, sorry, that didn't really answer your question. The Ugly Animal Preservation Society is a satir satirical society. Uh, trying to raise awareness of the un unloved endangered species that there are out there. Speaking of which, you've named them endangered mingers, I've seen. <laughs> um, could, you, could you perhaps run us through your top endangered mingers? Well, officially the ugliest animal in the world uh, is the blobfish. And we know it's official because we had an online poll. <laughs> I got a couple of my comedian friends to each, like, spend a couple of minutes championing these uh, these different disgusting species from mm. around the world um, on some YouTube videos. And then we got people to vote by liking the video. So Paul Foote, who is a fantastic, surreal, strange comedian, was the champion of the blobfish and he got more votes than anyone else. So officially the blobfish is the ugliest animal on the planet. Mm. Uh, the second ugliest animal on the planet is officially the kakapo. Now, this is a surprise. Uh, would you say a kakapo is ugly? No. <laughs> Could you, could you describe a kakapo to the people at home? It's, it's, isn't it a parrot? Parrots yeah, it's the world's only yeah. flightless parrot. Yeah. So my mate Steve Mould, who was championing it, he made the very good point that it's the world's only flightless parrot. Ergo, it's a rubbish parrot. 
It might be a rubbish flat. parrot, but that doesn't make it ugly, does it? Well, well, that's true. And the only reason why it's officially the second ugliest on the planet is because basically I am massive in New Zealand, which is of no practical <laughs> use to me whatsoever. <laughs> Because the, the people of New Zealand were just so pleased that anybody was talking about one of their endangered birds that we got in all of their press. So they gamed it. They, they were happy oh, to call it I ugly see. as long as it got yeah. attention. Oh, it was rigged. Yeah, yeah so those are officially the, the, the top number one and number two. Now, of course, much like nature documentaries, mm. he introduced us to some of the ugly animals we would never have heard of. So on tour, what he does yeah. is he gets cities to elect their own champion <laughs> ugly species. This is very interesting. <laughs> and for Winchester, well, I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to play the clip. <laughs> uh, London, it's the proboscis monkey. Winchester, it's the scrotum frog. Interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do think it's fine to say something about all these towns, what they yeah. vote. Mm. Does a scrotum frog look like a scrotum? Yeah, it does. It so does. the scrotum frog, it, it's... <sighs> to call it saggy would be an un- understatement. <laughs> it has these extra rolls of skin because it breathes through them. So, so the whole thing is, again, it is one of those, those examples where a hideous being is hideous to our eyes as an adaptation. Yeah. It lives high up in Lake Titicaca and it has to breathe through its skin. So, of course, the more skin you have, the more mm-hmm. you can breathe, the more easy it is. Larger surface area and all that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's an adaptation, but uh, we call it scrotum frog because it's a bit scrotumy. It has like a sort of leftover elbow look. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it is, it's hideous, but it's also... Wonderful. And, and unfortunately, again, because it's been called a scrotum frog, that is the precise reason it might be being driven to extinction now. Mm. Because we called it that, people thought it might be a virility cure. So literally oh, in Lake oh Titicaca, no. Bolivia and Peru, there are people who are putting them into liquidizers and making oh, frog frappes. Frog frappe. <laughs> frappes? Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. I think I'll pass oh. on that one. <laughs> Even just listening back to that. <laughs> I, know. I cannot believe that we genuinely spoke to a serious guest about the sagginess of a scrotum frog. And but a frog frappe. So what it all boils down to is introducing an audience to, you know, biodiversity and the amazing awesomeness of life on the planet, which is something that David Attenborough and the BBC Natural History Unit do very well yeah. with things like spectacular imagery and beautifully crafted, narrated documentaries. And Simon does a similar thing, but he does it through steering people into science through comedy. Yeah. And that's and it's really clever, actually. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, listeners, but uh, it's something we like to do as well. Suck you in because you're interested <laughs> in a TV show and throw some science at you. <laughs> <laughs> See what sticks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking, speaking of which, uh, shall we get back to, back to Blue Planet? Yeah. Yeah. We are in this episode talking about blue planet and big blue chip natural history documentaries if you were on the panel for blue planet three if you were writing the treatment you were in the production room what animals or what stories would you like to see front and center well for for nowadays everything has to have a conservation message Mm. and i know this is something which the world in general has woken up to but i i remember the first set of blue planets and the first set of planet earths and those kind of things and watching them as a kid i think it was during frozen planets maybe i'm wrong about this that i think there were seven episodes and seven were broadcast here in the uk but only six were in the us because the climate change one was was basically dropped wow on account of being seen over there as a political statement so over here in general we view climate change and things like that as a scientific endeavor rather than as a political endeavor Mm. Uh, that's changing even here now. Like our, our views and where science and politics overlap are, are altering a bit. But, I, you know, we can't ignore it. Uh, if we're talking about stuff, stuff that I would see as like musts that should be on the show would be trying to look at every single trophic level. So to look at the things which are teeny tiny and the things which are massive. Mm. Trying to quantify the scale of how unforeseen forces can feature. And yeah, because it's blue chip, yeah, you've got to have some of your star and roles. You've got to get a close up of a tuna and a shark and a whale and all the big stuff. But I think the real driver should be make sure that we don't forget the teeny tinies. Mm. And also to make sure that we don't forget the hot spots. And the good news is no one ever does because it's where you go to see really, really cool stuff. So go to the coral reef that mentioned how it was a lot bigger not too long ago. Mm. What teeny tinies would you? Would you like to see? 
Well, you can't you can't not talk about krill and zooplankton mm. and that kind of stuff. And you can't not talk maybe even about the bacteria and how they differ at the top and at the bottom. Mm. You know, where it's cold and there's no oxygen. Like the, the, one of the real joys about all the Blue Planet series ones is there's always a bit where they go, we've gone a bit deeper. We don't know what this is. <laughs> Looks weird, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I think actually of all of the places for you to maybe go and visit, maybe as a research your next tour, get down in the submarine, go down the Mariana Trench, because the stuff they find down there is the definition of weird. Yeah, there's a couple of difficulties there. So yes, you're you're right. I love it. Um, from, <laughs> from the society's viewpoint, it gets really tricky because in, in the vastness of an ocean, documenting endangered species is much, much tougher. So, you know, not trying to bring it back to the Ugly Animal Society again, but one of the reasons why it came into existence was also that there is legitimate underappreciation and under under understanding. Under is that did I just say that? Under understanding. It's a new there's phrase we'll coin it. Run with there's it. bound to be a better way, isn't there, though, than under squared standing. Yep. It's just a, <laughs> <laughs> We shall write that somewhere on the website. We'll get our yeah. t-shirt. <laughs> okay, well, let's accept the word I'm looking for now. Let's assume we all know. In conservation circles, we don't even understand the ungoly animals. We still look more at mammals and things which are on the scale of us that we can appreciate and cute things more than we look at everything else. So, for instance, there's a group called EDGE. Uh, EDGE stands for Evolutionarily Distinct Globally Endangered Um but they're trying to literally find out what animals are the most unique. Now, the thing that makes them the most unique is they've got the least number of cousins. So when you like look at the the, the world family yeah, yeah. tree of all the species that there are on it, there are a couple of branches out there which have been very heavily pruned. And there's no other <laughs> species. Humans are one of them. We are the, mm. the only, uh, the Homo sapien is the only species in the Homo genus, for instance, probably because we killed off everything else. We seem to be quite good at that. Mm. So they're trying to find out those like outliers <laughs> and find those things which are the most unusual. Uh, and then to work out, are they getting mm. the attention that they need and deserve? So to give you an example, lots of bats are important. Lots of bats are amazing. But if one species dies out, that is a tragedy. But at least we've got all the other species of bats. There's loads of them. They're like a third of all mammals, I think. But if the giant Chinese salamander disappears, we've lost half of the world's species of salamanders because there's only the Chinese variety and the Japanese variety. And they're huge and they're weird. Like a giant Chinese mm. salamander is bigger than I am. Mm. Oh, Lord, that is big. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Just made me sound like a massive... I'm, I am a... Uh, I am a, a giant. <laughs> I am six foot two and dashing, young listeners. No, I'm I'm a, I'm five He's ten. He's taking up the entire Zoom screen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you get my point, is that you've got to try, try and... They're trying to at least document and understand what things... They're, they're basically trying to focus on conserving most biology for our buck because mm. we're never going to save everything. As soon as you move that stuff to the seas, it's even harder. You know, our, our understanding of what is endangered on land is way, way better than anything that happens in the deep. And we know that everything that happens in the deep has got the nasty habit of spreading thanks to, to currents, like poisons and plastics and things end up everywhere. And you, you were talking there about the Mariara Church, Marinara. I said, did I say Marinara? Like you, did, in, you did say the Marinara Church, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just tomato with cat <laughs> sauce. Subway's next offering. <laughs> <laughs> But down there, they they find plastics we've not found anywhere in the entire planet now that we're not touching. So if you're going to have a blue chip documentary like this, it has to be honest. Oh, the Marinara Trench. Mm. Do you do you think that was a mistake, or do you think he did it on poor poise? You're you're thrilling me. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. So anyway, as you can tell, um, we definitely agree with Simon. <laughs> uh, we're delighted that um, the environmental challenges are being included mm. uh, in all of the messaging of these shows. But I, I mean, I also love that they introduce all the researchers that work on the science mm, too. Yeah. So you get to meet the people that have done the work that's being communicated. And what was also interesting is that um, he mentioned Edge there um, as a group and, and they mm. do look at the wacky and the weird you know, in terms of organisms, and they're looking for the weirdness of a species and using that to help generate income. So a lot of the major um, charities will will take those big, you know, blue chip animals, you know, like the whale, for example, and use those to, to talk about conservation and the importance of conservation, whereas Edge will take the weirdest of the creatures and use that weirdness to help you, you know. Could you be more Pacific? <laughs> 
Now, now. <laughs> right, I think it's time for us to, to change tack. Mm. Um, we all know that nature documentaries, you know, they get loads of praise for the amazing camera work yeah. and the insane visuals that they're able to put on our screen. But actually, one or the other, the flip side to the program is the soundtrack. It's everything else that you hear that helps create this amazing story. Yeah, and, and you know, on our program, we like to go down... Um, down rabbit holes that maybe is not the expected angle that you might be thinking. And of course, it is the International Year of Sound 2020. And we are a podcast. So we really ought to be looking at the sound behind these documentaries. Um, and you may have noticed when you're watching these, there's some amazing musical scores behind it. And also, mm. you know, this the the sounds of the animals moving around and the, you know, the environment about them. And, and this involves hundreds and hundreds of audio tracks all being laid a on top of each other. Now, Emma does all the work when it comes to the podcast and the editing at the end. And she's laying what, how many tracks are you laying when you're doing the podcast? Up to six. Up to six. Now we're talking hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds. Can you imagine doing that? I don't think uh, that would, that would be quite scary. I think it would take me a lot longer. <laughs> team. And of course, these uh, some of these sounds are recorded in the wild, as it were. Um, and other ones are artificially created. So to get the inside scoop uh, on working on some of the BBC Natural History Unit's biggest nature documentaries, we speak to Martin Harris now. Could this get any better? Oh. He is a BAFTA and <laughs> Emmy Award winning re-recording mixer, senior lecturer in audio and music technology at the University of the West of England. And <laughs> Karen is giggling away to herself. Yeah, I start that one in quite... You did. That was, was really good. Subtle, yeah. I thought. Absolutely jawsome. Well done. <laughs> Oh. Uh, now, as a professional sound man, I mean, to put it very loosely, mm. um, but he is definitely the go-to man to talk to about the audio of all things nature documentary yeah. and someone that I, for one, um, as a huge fan of everything Attenborough narrates and as a podcaster, I was super excited to talk to him about how important actually sound is in creating this really beautiful film. Well, perhaps let's, let's start with the science of sound. That's quite a broad question, but perhaps you can give us a bit of info. Uh, absolutely. To to become a good sound recordist or a good sound professional, you need to understand how sound works and the fact that the high frequencies are going to bounce off things in your proximity and the low frequencies aren't. But also um, you take that one stage further when you're trying to imagine creative soundscapes, you need to understand that sound underwater is going to work differently than sound in the air. So um, sound travels through water nearly five times faster than it travels through air. We don't think so because when we stick our head underwater in the bath, it all sounds a bit blurry and a bit odd um, because we're not designed to hear underwater. But those mammals that are, the whales, dolphins, all, all of those creatures that are designed, um, they can communicate over hundreds of miles with low frequencies and the sound is travelling much faster to them. There's not the lag that there is in the air. Now, Martin, you talked about underwater sound a little bit there, and obviously we are talking about Blue Planet 2. Um, but one of the first nature documentaries that was ever made underwater was by Jacques Cousteau, right? Yes. So Jacques Cousteau, when he first made his first film and became famous, he called it Silent Landscapes. You know, that's the, the biggest load of rubbish ever. <laughs> it, it's really not silent down there. It's full of sound. And um, anybody who's gone snorkeling or diving will tell you that it's a busy soundscape under the water. If we were to put the sound of the reef on the pictures of the reef, you would get so fed up very quickly in a film because um, there's this constant crackling mm. noise, which is um, partly made by shrimps and partly made by parrotfish um, crunching bits of coral. Y you can't get away from it. It's not silent at all. So you've got to be selective then when you're, you know, you're designing a soundscape for a documentary. Yes. So yeah. sound for film and sound for television is um, part truth, part artifice. If you were to make a truthful film about lions, well, 90% of your film is going to be shots of lions sleeping. <laughs> um, you know, they don't do a lot. They eat, sleep and have sex. That is all that these, you know, that's all they do. Get out of your head the reality of it. And what we're doing is storytelling. Mm. And in storytelling, we need to um, pull the viewer into the story. Part of the way you can get... Um, 
a viewer invested in the narrative is to draw them in on the soundtrack. Um, particularly these days and particularly with television, when you're watching television and everybody else is on their second screens doing something on their iPhone or their iPad, um, the only thing that draws them back to the screen is sound. So if you put interesting sounds in and punctuate the film properly, you will have them drawn to the screen and locked into your screen. Um, that isn't to say that all the sounds are completely natural. So under the film, you've got the natural sound that was recorded on location. And then you've also got layers of natural sound that was recorded somewhere else, but adds a bit of drama. That's right. And then you've yes. also got created sound. You've got Foley. So can you talk to us a little bit more about what Foley is and how it's used in natural history documentaries? Of course, yes. And all films, actually. Um, Foley's a fascinating part and most people get so fascinated by it. But the the best use of Foley is when you don't hear all of it. So Foley, the definition of Foley is a performed sound. So it's a sound that has character to it. Um, you can get a door opening off a CD or off a WAV file or off a file off a sound effects library. You can get door open. But if you want the door to open with some character or you want something special in there because the door opens very slowly, um, you would do that as a foley. Footsteps, for instance, are much easier done as foleys because you can watch the screen, get into character, get their rhythm and copy what they do. Now, footsteps aren't always recorded on set because the job of the sound recordist on set is to get the pristine, clean dialogue and any other sounds on set that might be difficult to to reproduce, like the only grunge fuddling machine in the world. You know, that's their job to get the sound of all that. A what machine? Grunge fuddle. <laughs> haven't, haven't you ever grunge fuddled, Karen? No, no. No, okay. I've never grunge fuddled. Well, the best well knowledge, if the there best. was a machine for grunge fuddling... <laughs> There might only be one in the world. You need to take a wild track of that. If you ever come across it, record it for me. So I'm imagining a Foley artist in a Foley studio. I mean, is yeah. is a Foley studio basically a place where it's completely cluttered, this crazy Alice in Wonderland kind of situation, just filled with different <laughs> things that can make a myriad of different sounds? Yes, it absolutely is. So I was in a Foley studio recently. Um, yeah, but there's usually a note. Please don't throw anything out. It might be a prop, not not rubbish. You know. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Foley studio I was in recently had a lot of different floors and a lot of different pits with surfaces. So you had sand, you had earth, you had um, straw, you had grass, um, you had gravel. Um you had a wooden floor, you had um, a pavement laid, you had a lino floor. Um, you've got a set of stairs in the corner that go nowhere. Um, you've got half a car door. Um, you've got a car bonnet. You've got all sorts of different kinds of metal. You need all these choices of sounds because you never know what you might need next. There are the water sounds don't get me on to water foleys. It's very messy. <laughs> um, we did a program about sharks once. Uh, the BBC had um, a, a big tank, which we filled with water. And um, I splashed around so much that um, you can still see the tide mark up the fabric walls of the studio <laughs> where it got a little bit too wet. Oh, brilliant. <sighs> so grunge fettling. Any Any ideas? Still, still no idea. Still, <laughs> but of all of the things that he told us, he also told us that apparently you have a foley face when you're working on yes, foley. Yeah. And very kindly, perhaps yes. foolishly, yes. Um, he showed us a glimpse of what his foley face looks like. And you just look like a gormless zombie. Yeah. And he very kindly let us take an image, which is brilliant. And we'll pop we on did. our Instagram. I screenshotted the Zoom. <laughs> Um, and although he's he's worked on lots of different nature documentaries, hasn't he? But he has a lot to tell us about sound in water, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, we are talking about Blue Planet after mm. all. The underwater sounds are quite difficult. Uh, water sounds, r rather, above water, um, they can sound a little bit too small and tinkly because obviously you might have a 35, I don't know, a 70 gallon tank, but it's still not as big as the Pacific Ocean. Um, so you can actually hear the water bouncing off the sides of the tank. So what you have to do is sink 
um, sink a, a sheet or um, something into the tank to stop the high frequencies bouncing around within the water. Oh, goodness. Um, and it's better to use warm water than cold water because it is a lower pitch very slightly. So talking about sound and water, mm. we know that sound travels faster and further in water. But science teacher Karen, yes, tell me why. Uh, well, it's all to do with density and how close the particles are together, how crammed they are in, in you know, a, sp- a particular space. Uh, so in water, the particles are much closer together than they are in air and therefore uh, the sound will travel faster and further. Simple as that. Neat. Yeah. So Martin also had some really cool anecdotes about working with the king, the great Sir David Attenborough, who, no offence, Karen, yes. but I would ditch you as a co-host for a podcast <laughs> without a second thought for. Um, And I wouldn't blame you. (laughs) So we're going to put some of those on our Patreon. Uh, So if you, you know, if you'd like to support us on our Patreon, that would be great. Just a few, you know, a few pounds a month really helps in terms of the costs of of putting on a podcast. Yes. And we'll also share, he's got some fun Foley stories about how you make uh, the sounds of things above water, such as an Mm. elephant. How do you make the sound of an elephant? It's amazing, isn't it? And he talked to us all about leg joints and all sorts. Yeah. And how complicated it is. But uh, talking of Foley, he also gave us a heads up on a on a couple of different Foley ideas, didn't he? That we ought to we ought to try out for our first experiment on the podcast for this series. Yes, I am here. I'm ready. I am taking the the role of I was going to say being experimented on, but that's not quite right, isn't it? You're you're doing the experiment uh, and putting my knowledge to the test. Yes, and I. So what I'm going to do is I've got here two jugs of water. Mm-hmm. One jug has got hot water in it and one jug has got cold water in it. Now, one of the things that he mentioned is that we have the ability to hear the difference between hot water and cold water. Okay. Okay. So I'm popping these uh, near the microphone. So we're hoping we, this picks up nicely for you listeners. And what I want you to do is um, experiment along with uh, Emma. Okay. So this is jug number one. And jug number two. Now, for those of you experiment minded, same size jug, same volume of water, same type of glass. Number one or number two? Uh, which one was hotter? Was number two? Was that um, was that the making a cup of tea jug as opposed to the cold water on a yes. sunny day? Oh, phew. So the second, the second one is hot water, and it makes a completely different sound it as you're pouring it into the into the glass. It's amazing, isn't it? It actually does. So why is it? Yeah. Why does boiling water sound so different? Well, there's a lot of debate about this online. Lots of debate. Um, so a lot of people think it might be to do with the viscosity, which mm. is quite a nice word. I like that word, viscosity. So um, a hot water is less viscous than cold water. So the suggestion is that this would have an impact on the sound that's being created because uh, water itself doesn't really make a sound, but it's the bubbles that are are being created inside the water as it moves around. That's what generates the sound. And of course, having hot or cold water, more or less viscous solution might have an impact on on the sounds that are being generated. So it's funny, actually, that you're you're able to tell the difference just through sound. And, you know, research backs it up that actually people above the age of six are able to tell the difference between hot and cold water when they're hearing it poured. There was even a, a study that came out in um, 2020 that 93 percent of people were accurate when they were guessing and they couldn't see like steam or anything, um, whether it was hot water or cold water being poured, even though they often didn't think they were going to be able to. They could. Yeah, and that's amazing, isn't it? And mm. and the fact that it's over six suggests that it's something that we learn over time. So we're listening to people making a cup of tea or, or filling a glass with water, and then we can hear the difference in tones mm. and the difference in frequencies. Um, and there was actually someone who's looked at the acoustics of this. And what they've done is that they've discovered that when you pour water into a vessel, into a glass or a cup, there's actually three main sources of sound that's happening there. So one is the resonance of the air that's left inside the container as you're filling it up with water. Mm. Um, The second one is the vibration of the container in the water. So that generates the sound as well because sound's all about vibrations. Um, And then the third one is the sounds of the water itself. And that's generated by the bubbles that are forming as you're pouring the water in. So Mm. you've got those three different soundscapes. Um, And in hot water and cold water, they're, they're different. The proportions of each of those is different. 
So in cold water, the vibration of the container in the water, that's the dominant sound, the one that you can hear. Mm. Um, but in its, when it's hot water, it's more about the resonance of the air in the column. And of course, that might be affected by steam, I'm guessing. Mm. But, we st- but that, that explains the sounds that are happening, but not necessarily why they're happening. And that's where the debate's still ongoing as we, as we record this episode. So that's really interesting. Stay tuned. Well, I mean, now you've made me uh, really want to go and make a cup of tea. <laughs> I think we might have to call that a day for our first episode back in season two. Yeah, I think so. I I really enjoyed that. So um, what kind of phrases do you think we managed to get in in this episode? Okay, I've been making a little list. So we started out with um, whale hello there, topping off the episode. Nice. (laughs) We had totally great to be back. Mm -hmm. Water we're talking about today. We did manage to, I did manage to get in cod this be any better which That's I was really, quite I pleased like that with. one. Yeah. We did have some quite cringe introductions of fantastic and jawsome. <laughs> uh, and your personal favourite, was that a mistake or did you do that on <laughs> poor voice? Poor voice. And I have to thank my husband for that one. That was, that's, <laughs> <laughs> he did very that well was his there. idea. He did very well there. So that's about all we've got time for. So we've mentioned you can support the show on Patreon and mm-hmm. you can also find out a little bit more about what we're doing and what we're up to by following us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And you can drop us an email at smallscreensci at gmail.com. And if you head on over to our website, you can have a look at our blog posts, which will all be linked to this episode. So go on, leave us a cheeky review. Five stars would be great, you know, just for the halibut. And uh, (laughs) make sure that you (laughs) make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss our episode next week. We'll see you soon. Bye.